The purpose of this short tutorial is just to demonstrate that if you were to export your mesh as one giant object, so it's in one entire mesh, you can see here we've got one asset which is a low poly, and it's got LP, or LP in this case, and we've got our HP equivalent. If we were, let's assume we were rushed for the ICA, and it was a case that we didn't have time to rename everything accordingly, which can in some cases take quite a while, and we adopted the approach where we just simply exported the low, exported the high, and dumped that into Substance Painter, that in itself is going to cause issues. So the correct way to do it would be to explode the mesh, essentially take away or take apart the asset so the cage no longer intersects, then that would give us a far, far better result. So the output, if you were to adopt a process of just pumping out a low and a high and then allowing Painter to do its bake, it's, it's going to give us something on these lines. I'm not going to bother uh, doing the actual bake again, but it's just the bog standard settings and anywhere where there's a cage intersection, we end up with all kinds of strange errors. So you can see it's, it's riddled with problems at the moment. So anywhere where there is an intersection is going to cause an issue. So the correct way to do it would not be to do it in the manner which I've just done over here, as in have one gigantic high and one gigantic low. The idea is that you split those individual components apart and then make sure that the cage no longer intersects. And then we shouldn't have those problems. So I'll just go back to my original file over here. So what I've done here is I've split my low poly into individual components and my high poly corresponds with the low poly. So if I was to just unhide everything, let's have a look to see what we've got. So I have set this up uh, to utilize a selection. I'm going to cancel that down. So I'll pick my low poly and just go to my selection over here. So I've split it up into numerous components and every individual component is called underscore L. So that's going to be all my low poly. So let's have a look exactly what's going on there. So here we have that as one element, so two underscore L of the low poly, obviously. We have this bit over here, and that's one underscore L. You don't have to be absolutely perfect with the naming. As long as the naming corresponds with a high, it's easier in this instance for me to just say one is going to be called one underscore L, two underscore L, three underscore L, and then ultimately I'll have say 15 components, each one is called underscore L, and I'll have the same corresponding high components and they'll be called underscore H. I purely use a numeric value and underscore L because it's quicker. If you were to do it properly, you could say, you know, bolts underscore L, bolts underscore H as the case may be. It's not going to make a great deal of difference, but in the long run, it's probably advisable to use uh, a proper naming convention and not adopt this uh, process purely because of the fact that later on somebody may well need to open that asset and 10 underscore L isn't going to make a great deal of sense to them. So what I've done is rather than split every single individual section into you know this being 1 underscore L, this being 2 underscore L, this being 3 underscore L, no need to do that. All you need to do is make sure that in the bake there is no intersections. So clearly it's safe to say that this asset over here is in a completely different location to this one over here. So the cage of that and that would not intersect. Clearly the cage of this and this would intersect. So there is no exact process. As long as your individual components are far apart, then that is sufficient enough. So as you can see in here, I've just separated these ones off and I've just made sure that none of those intersect. Clearly they don't. And naturally my high equivalent would accommodate that as well. So if I just select those two areas over, over here. So we can see now we've got our 14 underscore H, which is 14 underscore high poly, and we have our equivalent 14 underscore L. So this is something that if you were at the very beginning of your mesh, go around and name the high and the low accordingly, and there wouldn't be no need to do it right at the end where you're going to split it up and break it up, uh, which in itself is extremely time consuming. So it's advisable at the very beginning to get your naming conventions right and name each appropriate element underscore H or underscore L or underscore HP, underscore low P, whatever you feel is necessary. The suffix is important because Painter is going to use that as a basis to understand which is the high poly, 
which is a low poly, and then explode internally uh, when it renders your normal map out. So the next process, I'll hold the video because it will take a, a while, is I'll dump it into uh, Painter and then we'll utilize this individual component um, and then we'll try and export all that out and get it to work. So the process would be make sure that I'm now got a selection group which makes sense. So I click on my underscore LP, that's comprised of 16 individual components as you can see under here, under here. Make sure you check everything to make sure it's all good. I do have some floaters but that's fine. So that's all good. We've got the right low poly one selected and with those selected export those. So I'm just going to export over my low poly OBJ. And then a quick way of doing it is just press Ctrl I, invert the selection and hide unselected. Or you could just make sure that you've got a selection set up here, high poly, hide unselected. You don't necessarily need to do that step because you can just go file export selected. But I tend to find it's, it's a bit more self-explanatory when all I've got on screen is whatever I want my height to be. So we can just select all those. Let's confirm we have the correct selection on here. Yep, that makes sense. Everything corresponds with our low poly and then export again. This is where I'll inevitably pause it because this will take a while. In fact, we'll do, we'll do this particular section in real time. Just to iterate a point of if you go wild with your turbo smooths and produce you know, substantial sums of uh, uh, geometry, then naturally this process will take even longer. So I'm just gonna click export and give it a few moments. So what it will do is it'll take every individual component and export export the lot out so as you can see it's taken you know it's not forever but you know it's taken long enough I suppose for, for an asset of this complexity if you went nuts and you had a uh, turbo to subdivision 5 level via ZBrush or whatever uh, the probability of it crashing is quite high and naturally it's gonna slow painter down when it do bake, when it does actual bake so that's okay so that would be the generic process essentially Detach all your low poly ones, detach the corresponding high poly ones, name them correctly, then dump them into Painter, which will be the very next step. So I'm going to pause it before I do the next bit. So let's just go into Painter and essentially bake our new normal map across. So make sure PBR metal roof is on. Select our low poly, which is comprised of multiple correctly named components. Click on open. Make sure DirectX is on 2048 by 2048 is sufficient enough at this stage. Uh, I will need to most probably pause the video because it can take quite a while to out the normal map, even at that resolution. So maybe long term wise, but a quick test, 1024 would be probably more advisable. So 2048, click on OK. That's going to bring our, our asset out in multiple components. All we need to do is click on Big Textures, same process as before, 2048 by 2048. Select our high poly, which is comp also comprised of correctly named multiple components that correspond with our low poly components. Turn on mesh name, because now we are trying to utilize the mesh name as a basis for painter to ascertain the high and the low and bake accordingly via explosion, internal sort of explosion of the mesh. And if you look at a high poly suffix, we've called ours underscore H, just because it's, it's quicker to do that than type in underscore high every single time and underscore L. If you turn on anti-aliasing, natural is going to give you better results. Subsampling 8x8 can take forever, especially with a large output size, and I mean forever. Bearing in mind I have 64 gig of RAM and it does take quite a while to do that. So I'll just leave on 2x2x2 for the time being and I'll most probably just pause the video temporarily and then we'll do that break and then when it's finally come back to life I'll unpause it. So now that the bake is finished, we can get a, a good indication of what exactly it's done. So bearing in mind when we did the previous bake, lots and lots of errors, whatever uh, geometry was intersecting, so any area where the, uh, the cage would effectively intersect. And now you can see the number of errors is significantly, significantly reduced. So essentially, make sure you bake out. It looks like there's a slight error over here where there's some intersecting, so maybe I would need to go back into my naming conventions and just triple check to make sure that these aren't being baked um, next to existing geometry 
which is effectively causing some form of uh, intersecting occurred. So that would certainly need repairing. And over here, you can just see a slight issue over here. Whiz around your asset anywhere which appears to be incorrect, go in there and fix. Majority of cases, it should be absolutely fine. Also, just be aware of the fact that if you've got a small area where there's a slight bake error, uh, is it worthwhile to go back in there and rebake and everything? In most cases, you can get away with not necessarily doing that. Imagine if this texture was 1024 by 1024, naturally all those errors would be quite small and less noticeable. And also taking into account when you start adding uh, you know, materials on there, then that's also going to have an impact in terms of hiding bits and bobs. So let's just drop this material on there. And then you can see straight away those errors slightly. Well, it's still obviously there, but you know, less prominent as such. But I would certainly go in there and fix those ones. Where I do have slight minor issues, which is I think there's an issue over here. Just slightly under there, there's a bit of an issue. I can actually get away with not worrying about that. Okay, I'll just leave that one alone. But anywhere else, I would go around and fix accordingly. So just make sure that you adopt a policy of multiple components, all correctly named, and then when you do your bake, uh, everything should be fine. And just to quickly you know, sort of demonstrate what we can do with this, if I just drop a quick rough finish on top of that, that will immediately give us some form of metallic look. And then naturally, the more I adopt uh, additional materials to drop on there, clearly, you know, we know that the handle needs to be wood. So it just goes to show you that without a great deal of effort, you can make things look, you know, metallic and old and the rest of it. Uh, I do have an existing uh, uh, old sci fi gun, it was a very Good one which I managed to download off the internet. It's on the Substance Share site. You can download that, just drag the zip file into here and it should work fine. I'm using an older version of uh, Substance Painter, your version might be slightly different. Clearly, you can see, you know, just a drag and drop approach in most cases can produce all kinds of really weird and wonderful effects that are actually pretty cool as well. So, on top of that, we can just use smart masks. So if I was to just go to, say for example, Edge is Strong, just drop that onto there. And now you can see, whatever the edge was, it almost tries to blend in with the uh, existing texture underneath and such. So not much effort required, and you can produce all kinds of weird and wonderful results. But the way it works is, if you have a very good high and a very good low, then the rest of it will always fall into place. If it's a case you don't have that, then no matter what you do within this, you're not going to make a significant improvement to the artwork. It will be self-evident that there's lots and lots of errors. We know there's errors in this one in certain areas. That's relatively straightforward to fix. We will just go back to our base and make the changes accordingly. And I think that would be probably the best methodology to approach. So yes, just dragging on another material and we can now try and identify where we want to keep bits and bobs and where we want to try and remove some areas that don't quite work and where we can add additional masks as the case may be. So tinker with that and that is the general process to try and get multiple components from high to lows all into Substance Painter from Max.